Hi, uh, this is Jack Stanley, and I wanted to talk about a little bit more about Edison's recording practices and some of the unusual things that they tried, some of the things that worked, some of the things that didn't work, uh, some of the things that caused a lot of issues and problems. Uh, one of the things right away we have to understand is that the Edison Diamond Disc, which came out commercially around 1912, was a remarkable product. Uh, Sound-wise, uh, quality-wise, durability-wise, it had no equal. But it did have some issues. Of course, the thing right away, right from the beginning, was that no other machine could play it. Because Edison made his diamond disc to be Hill and Dale, not lateral, which sort of like Victor or Columbia at the time, and some of the other off-brands that were uh, quite illegal, actually, at the time. But Edison went Hill and Dale, and for patent reasons, and also the fact that he liked Hill and Dale. The cylinder worked on Hill and Dale, and it was an area that no one seemed to be interested in, except for Pathé, and a couple of the smaller off-brands uh, were using. But Edison's system of recording was a dead studio. That was his idea. He, he didn't want to have any kind of sounds uh, interrupting. He didn't want to have room sound. He didn't want to have any kind of echo. He didn't want to have any kind of interruption from what he considered the performance. Now, what is interesting about this is there would be lots of curtains hung all around the recording room to absorb all the echoes. Being that it was Hill and Dale, there weren't as many issues with blasting, although there still were some. But if you think about like the Victor Company and the Columbia Company, when it came to recording acoustically by horn, that if you sang too strongly or played too strongly into the horn that was recording laterally, the signal would be too great and would spill into other grooves. And also, it would wear down the record real fast. And so there was a habit of moving forward, back and back and forth when you made recordings or turning your head or looking up or whatever it may be. Um... I remember years ago talking to, um, through a, a friend, talking to Louise Homer's daughter. And Louise Homer's daughter was telling me about the fact that her mother talked about the proverbial Congo line that they did while making the first Rigoletto Quartet. Uh, because they had to move forward, move back, lean over, move in, look up, ba ba, just to control the singing uh, power for the record. Because if you were too loud, too strong, too direct into that horn, you could blast. So with the Edison Company, you, you didn't have this kind of a situation happening very often although they were very, very careful not to blast, because first off, they had to get past Edison, because Edison listened to everything they recorded, and Edison was a fierce critic of his own uh, records, but also of the performance, the singers, the singer's tremolo, the singer's uh, style of singing, and he would get offended by certain songs. There was a song called By the Sea, By the Sea, By the Beautiful Sea. He, he panned that. He refused to have it. He said, I will not allow that on my photograph. He thought it was obscene. And <laughs> he didn't want it. And uh, he wrote about it, the fact that he's not going on my phonograph, his baby. You have to understand, it, it's a very interesting thing and a very personal thing with, with Edison is that he looked at the phonograph and he referred to it as my baby. It was his creation. And so he guarded it, watched it, dealt with it like a jealous father. And therefore, he would only allow certain songs to be on his baby. 
And that was a big problem. But nonetheless, recordings were made in those studios in New York. And they did venture into different areas of recording. Now, Edison started doing experimentations using larger horns, different sized horns, different shapes, and this and that. And it led to a whole series of, of experiments at the Columbia Street Studios, which was right next door to the laboratory complex. And they did experiments with various sized horns, and eventually this led to the famous or infamous, in some people's minds, the 125-foot horn. Now, I have described before in one of the talks about the fact that it was encased in a building. There was another building where there was the uh, recording room. And, of course, the performance room was in the main building of the Columbia Street Studios. Incidentally, if you ever wanted to know where Greetings from the Bunch of Bunch at Orange was recorded, it was recorded at the Columbia Street Studio, and the uh, recording engineer marked with a short horn, just so you know. Um, in that studio, it was padded with cow hair, and there was the cow hair would basically deaden the studio so there'd be no sounds at all. And Theodore Edison used to say you'd walk in there and whistle and there would be no echo. It just kind of swallow up the sound. And they had uh, screens in front of the large horn, which was monstrous. You could stand in the opening of the horn. And there were squares all over that floor. And these markings would be used in conjunction to paperwork that was made for the studio. And when a recording was made, certain instruments, certain performers would be on different squares and different areas of the room. And everything was very carefully noted. Like the pianist was on square 14, the saxophonist was on 23. You know, the, the trumpeter, let's say, was on 47. Whatever it may be. And they'd be in all different areas of the room playing into that horn. And they would do lots of takes a lot of times. There were lots of experiments. Unfortunately, a good deal of them weren't extremely successful because there turned out to be lots of problems with that horn. First off, when it was first built, there was echoes in the horn. And that drove Edison nuts. And also they discovered that weather had such a profound effect upon the recording capabilities using that horn. They eventually put baffles in it. He had everything in the world done trying to change the way the sound worked. Of course, putting the baffles in totally... Uh, messed up the whole idea of the 125 feet of clear space for the sound to move because his ideas was, was basically untangled sound. He wanted to untangle the sound that was all tangled together. He felt the trumpets and clarinets, their notes would crash into each other, and you'd get this, whatever you want to call it, this tangled music. And after 125 feet, it would untangle itself and be smooth. Now, there are some remarkable recordings that were made with that 125-foot horn, and there were a lot of dogs. And it's interesting, when you go through the logs of the 125-foot horn, the various experiments that were done and how many were just bad. They also tried to do things in other ways at the Columbia Street Studio. They tried to take a lot of cylinders and make them into discs. Theodore Roosevelt, for instance. Uh, also, um, Victor Herbert, who, who I've mentioned before, was for a very short time director of artists and repertoire for Edison, and they just clashed on everything because, well, Victor Herbert was a composer and a very well-established musician. And, of course, Edison was in a very different league. And he and Herbert were just talking like this at each other. And, and eventually, Herbert just left in a huff. 
and never recorded for Edison again. It's a pity. It would have been interesting to have had Edison Diamond Discs of the Victor Herbert Orchestra. It would be really great recordings, I'm sure. We do have cylinders. But the cylinder experiments, turning the cylinders into discs, it just didn't work. Now, there were some other experiments done there that were very, very interesting. Edison had this idea that why don't we take established songs that exist, play them backwards, and see if we can find new melodies, melodies that are unlike any that exist today. And so I can tell you, one was record number 10,000 as a matrix, recorded in the Columbia Street Studio. And I want to talk about this for a little bit, because you'll see it listed, but there won't be too much information about it. Oddly enough, for a number of years, I had that record. And, and now it's uh, Charlie Hummel has it in his collection. But the interesting thing about that record was it's Dancing in the Barn played backwards. And so it almost sounds Russian <laughs> when you listen. You know, it's a very, very strange kind of sound that you hear. And Edison, well, Edison wasn't too pleased with what he heard because it wasn't very melodious, as, as he found out. And, and the thing also about it was this, that the 10,000 record, um, was tested, Edison looked at it, didn't like it, and it seems that that whole concept and idea kind of died. Although there were a few more backwards recordings made, but very, very few. And that was one of the really failed experiments at the Columbia Street Studios. There were lots of things done. There was the dubbing of cylinders. Also, the long play records were recorded at the Columbia Street Studio. And it's interesting how they did it. They had two diamond disc machines and a recording machine with a movable horn. And for the long play, the horn would be moved to each of the machines back and forth as they changed records. And very quietly, they would change the records and make the recording, because you have to remember, those long play records were very, very difficult to record, because the grooving was insanely small. Theodore Edison said, on those uh, playback needles, the, the, their rate of success of making the needles was not very great, and they were long and slightly bent and shaped like a canoe or a football. And those records were interesting, second-generation acoustic recordings, but still they lasted a long time. They played quite a while, and it was, as I said before, a very simple affair of switching that horn back and forth to make those long play records. There were a couple of experiments with direct-to-disc long plays, but as far as I'm aware. I don't think any of them were released commercially. Sort of like uh, a couple of years later, RCA came out with its long play record in 1931 or so. The first was a direct-to-disc recording, and then they did transcriptions and, and occasionally had a direct-to-disc recording. But Edison's were pretty much all um, uh, transcriptions. So the Columbia Street Studio is really quite a fascinating place. So much went on there. And I'm sure a lot of arguments went on there, too, because, you know, Edison would be over there all the time and directing them what to do and telling them that they didn't understand their music and their sounds were not right. And I remember, you know, uh, Ernest Stevens, who was his personal pianist, he said, you know, he, he would play the piano on a lauder piano, which, of course, was constantly changed because you had to change them because Edison would say that the pianos were jazzed out. And when a piano got jazzed out, that meant 
jazz had been played upon it, it was no good anymore, and they'd have to go get another one. And as mentioned before, they kept the number of the piano, and if you ever get the opportunity to do some research on the 125-foot horn, I'd recommend you go through some of those logs and find out the numbers. It's really quite fascinating, because some of them might be around still to this day. So it's just, just some thoughts about the recording studios of, of Edison's company and how they did their work and how those records were made, and they were incredible. It's a pity in many respects that some of the stuff that we wish had been recorded was not, that perhaps had Edison been a little bit more lenient in his understandings and allowing other people to judge and pick music, which eventually he would, but it would be too late. The damage had been done already. But uh, it was a fascinating period of time, a fascinating style of recording. I mean, nothing comes close to what the Edison Company was able of, of, of creating on record. Long before microphones were ever used, they made recordings that were starting startlingly close to uh, an electrical recording, especially the late acoustics, remarkable quality. And it's startling. It really is. It's a hard word to get out. Startling. There we are. Um, so that's about all I have to say. I just wanted to chat a little bit on this. And I'm sure lots of people have other things they'd like to talk about and I'd like to hear things that you'd like to talk about. Maybe we can have a dialogue and lots of people can make recordings on this and talk about this stuff because it's good stuff to share so we can all learn, experience, and, and uh, gain in our knowledge of history and recording.